everybody doing this morning? Everybody well? Everybody well? You know it's a it's still a blessed time to be an American. Amen. It's a blessed time to live in America. It's a great place to be a Christian. A lot of times, you know, just a few months ago we said that with a lot more exuberance and joy. Now things get a little rough and we start changing our tune a little bit. But let me tell you something, something God just kind of whispered to me Friday night when we were here. Everything he said before this happened didn't get nullified and voided because this happened. Right? Everything God says, he says with perfect foreknowledge. Even the mistakes that we make. God said what he said, right? God said what he said and his word will not return void. So when God speaks things, God speaks things from this perfect place of this omniscient position where he knows everything that has happened that's going to happen, right? So it's a, it's, a, it's a great day to be a Christian. It's a great chance to be a light. Let the lights go out. We can be a brighter light than we've ever been in the land. We just have to trust God. And here from God, as I was writing my check, I told Nicole, I can't, when I'm trying to get zoned in and focus on the Lord, it makes me very tender. And I try to keep that because I'm too tender sometimes. And I realize today's my dad's birthday. And uh, <clears throat> 17 years ago, we buried him. And uh, I thought about that. And then I thought about this morning. I've got two brothers. And my dad was an imperfect man. He's a pastor, but he was not a perfect man. Per great dad. And uh, I remember one of the last things I heard him say from the pulpit was, I'm a man who made a lot of mistakes. But I got three sons in the ministry and a daughter that serves the Lord. And this morning, there's three sons in a pulpit somewhere. So my dad's gone, been gone 17 years come August the 11th. But three sons are in a pulpit this morning. Three sons are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Three sons are not out in the world because my dad made mistakes. Three sons are serving the Lord because even though my dad made mistakes, he kept on doing what he knew to do. He kept on doing all he knew to do, right? And because of that, that's why I'm here this morning. One Mother's Day, I asked the Lord to honor my mother. And very quickly, the Lord responded and said, that's why you're where you're at. Because I'm honoring your mother. And I'm here because of my mother and my father. And you know what? My heart's desire is that when my children get older, they'll say the same thing about me and their mother. That they're going to honor the Lord because me and their mother honor the Lord. And so last Sunday, I didn't know if I was going to share this or at what point, but we'll get there in just a second. If you want to go to the book of James in chapter 3 and be ready, we'll be going there next. That's where we'll kick off. And the, the title of our sermon today will be Wisdom for the Hour. Wisdom for the Hour. Wisdom for the Hour. But I got home and Nicole, uh, I went outside to do something. Even when I'm dead tired, I can only rest a little while and I've got to get up and go. I can't sit around. I mean, I don't, I don't, that's just not me. I, I feel like a bum if I lay around too long. I, my body aches and hurts. So I was outside doing something. So I come inside and uh, my son's over there writing something down. And he tells me, he said, Dad, I heard the Lord say something to me this morning. I had to write it down. He's nine, mind you. Man, I hate I started off so weepy. Uh, we'll get it together. Maybe. We'll see. Heck, I don't know. And uh, it was so real to him. He asked his sister, did you hear that? He lived in faith. Yeah, we was up here praying for our sister to be healed of cancer and brain tumors. And the Lord's over there talking to him, over there sitting down. And I'm over there making sure he ain't on his iPad, not knowing if the Lord's talking to him or not. Not even thinking about the Lord talking to him. We get so caught up trying to be a parent. In the natural, we forget there's a supernatural upbringing we got to do. There's a sensitivity to the spirit that we've got to impart to our children. Man, I need him to hear from God more than I need him to look like he's paying attention. You understand? I need to worry more about what God thinks about what I'm doing than what you think about what I'm doing. You understand? I'm telling you, a lot of times we raise our kids based on what other people think about them. 
And we judge how we raise our kids, whether you think I'm doing a good job or not, but I really don't care what you think. I do and I don't. I don't mean to say it that way. It's just how I feel in a moment. But I got to care what God thinks. And I got to care so much what he thinks that that's how I feel about what you think. So he writes down on his paper. I mean, he's nine. He don't talk like this. And Brother Gary taught on prayer. And we're kind of going to lead in there just a little bit today. And, and it may be a lot. We'll see. And so this is his words. He's nine. He said, there are many wise things that men can do. But pray is the best. There are many wise things that men can do. He's a boy. He's a boy. Let me tell you something. He don't know nothing else when he becomes a man. If he remembers that one thing God told him, he'll be okay. If he remembers that one revelation from God, he's going to be a good man. If he'll know, you know what? There's a lot of, there's a lot of wise things. And when I was studying and getting ready, I had forgot this phrase. I had forgot that he said this. And then it hit me. Gosh, I'm preaching his little revelation this morning, right? And, uh, you know, and the Lord showed him a picture, you know. He had just this vision, you know. I'm just like, man, golly, this is amazing. So I just, I, I, I just uh, honor our pastor for just his work here in the ministry. I honor Brother Gary for just keeping the atmosphere where the Lord can be here, right? God don't do that in atmospheres where he's not, right? So we're, we live in a blessed place where many people can carry the anointing and maintain the anointing and cultivate the anointing, and that's what it requires in this hour. Amen. So we're going to go to the book of uh, James in chapter 3. You know, I'm going to have to be honest with you. During these days, I have to cut the news off. I can get into the flesh very quickly. I realize I am very opinionated. Uh, Nicole probably already knew that. I have my thoughts and way things ought to be. I can agree with you or disagree with you very quickly. Uh, but I have found that the Lord has been quickening me to shut up a lot more lately when it comes to, I've even had people ask me lately, now what's your opinion? What's your thinking? God, you got to say something. I said, man, I ain't saying nothing. I can't say nothing about some things for one of two reasons. I will say the wrong thing or I will say the wrong thing eventually, right? Because I will get in the flesh because it's very frustrating the times that we live in and how things are being handled and how we observe things going about. And if we're not careful, we'll forget that we have an enemy and he is unseen. Right? The enemy that we are dealing with is unseen, but we are so caught up with what we see that we address what we see and we forget what we don't see and the enemy we don't see will play us. We will be played. We will, we will be, be played to act out by what we see and completely that the just shall live by faith. That we walk by faith and not by sight. And we'll forget there are many things that wise things a man can do. But pray is the best. And in James in chapter 3, and we're probably going to read quite a few scripture. I have very little notes, but I have a lot of scripture. And I think that may be worse. All right, we'll see. All right, James chapter 3. I tell you what, if I go a little long, we'll counsel church tonight. Spend it with your families, all right? We'll do that this weekend. All right, uh, James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Now, this we have just left talking about how great a matter a little fire kindleth, talking about the tongue. Now we're leading into this. Who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You know, we live in a time where uh, racial tensions are high. Political tensions are high. They have joined forces. Right? Racial tensions have joined forces with political tensions. And it is a time where the church has got to be sure where we put our feet, right? Because we cannot give way to the agenda of the enemy to divide our nation because we are known as a Christian nation, right? We have been a nation that has sent more than over half the world's missionaries out into the world. We make up less than 5% of the world's population. Did you know that? It blew my mind too. We make up less than 5% of the world's population, yet we send out more missionaries than everybody else combined. That's what we're known for, right? And that is what the enemy's really attacking. He could care less if you're white, if you're black. 
He just don't want us to get along. He don't care if you're an illegal or illegal. He just don't want there to be no unity. He don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. He just does not, he does not want us operating in a unified platform saying that, you know what, we're a nation that stands for God. Amen. And we're going to make sure that that foundation stands. Do I post more to, on my social media account to defend my heritage naturally than I do my heritage spiritually? Do I care more about how I'm represented in my natural history than I do my spiritual history? Have I been so passionate about Jesus Christ as I am over every other issue? Right? That is where the reins of our heart are being revealed. And as Christians, the Lord has really been dealing with me you don't have time to have an opinion because my opinion may not be his. And God forbid I act in opposition to him. God forbid that I act. If God be for you, who can be against you? If God be against you, who can be for you? Right? So we're looking at this thing. So I've got it with meekness. I've got to get this bitter envy and strife in my heart out. I've got to glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. I mean, do we have to explain that, right? It says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. I learned this verse at 20 years old, helping Nicole's grandmother teach a fifth and sixth grade Sunday school class. And I've always, I thought, confusion in every evil work, every evil work, over a little bit contention, how do churches get destroyed over a little bit of strife? Because a little bit of tension lets every evil work in. Every evil work in. That's why I have to be guarded. I got to guard my unity. I've got to guard my unity with you, even if you're doing something I disagree with. I've got to guard our unity. Why? Because if I allow envy and strife to enter in, then guess what? The door is flung wide open, right? But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, right? Then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. I don't care what is going on. Does that match your opinion? I don't care what side we're on. I mean, we're live streamed. There, there's people listening all over the country it's, it, we, every Sunday. It don't matter where we stand, does my opinion match that verse? I mean, I, when you really break this thing down, man, we have to really be a little more careful. We just left off, if, if I was to digress, which I don't want to because I need to move forward, that we're talking about bitter and sweet water flowing out of the same fountain. Those things ought not to be so, Right? And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Man, this is tough stuff. From whence come wars and fightings among you. This is chapter 4 and verse 1. Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members. So listen, we have a natural man. When I got born again, I was born again a spiritual man. But the downfall to modern salvation is I've still got the natural man. I mean, if we could just get saved, go to heaven, be perfect forever, I mean, that'd probably be a utopia experience. But you know what? We have to learn to become the new man while killing the old man. Right? That is a, that is a, that is a paradoxical statement. That is a conflicting interest inside of me. The Bible says stuff like the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit's lust against the flesh. So the flesh don't like the spirit, but the spirit don't like the flesh. You don't like me, I don't like you. All right, we have that in common. Right, there is a battle going on. There's a struggle in our members. And guess what? I have been my natural man a long time. And he knows how to get his way. He knows how to do it. But the only way I can overcome him is through the Spirit. And when I, through the Spirit, 
make agreement with the Spirit of God, then I have the authority over my natural man through the power of agreement. So that's why it's so important that we seek God, right? It says, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. And then this is a, this is a big one. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. And then we could break that down and say, am I praying God's will or am I praying my opinion? And when I first come to the, I just realized this past June the 18th, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. A lot of things going on right now. Filled with the Holy Ghost. And I, there was a brief stint where I went in a Pentecostal church, if you were to pray through, you prayed through to the Spirit. And then I realized I could speak in tongues and get up and be angry when I walked outside. And so I realized that praying through really was the praying like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed till his will got broke, to where he prayed till it was not his opinion. Up to, if it was left up to Jesus, he would not have went to the cross. I think we miss that sometimes. When he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, meaning that his will was contradictory to the will of God. Like the perfect flesh. If perfect flesh has a contradictory will, how much does imperfect flesh have a contradictory will? If a man who never sinned, right, never made a mistake, never, never acted out of, never let his wrath uh, worketh not the righteous, unrighteous, the righteousness of God, never let his wrath be unrighteous before God. If he had a contradictory will, how great a contradiction do we really have? And let me tell you something, what we've learned to do, and Satan is great with the word. He can use the word to justify his stance. He is the accuser of the brethren. Well, guess what? We got that same trait. We can pick any stance and find us a little old scripture, and we say this, we preach the whole Bible at our church. Go to any other denomination and ask them that they preach the whole Bible. They say the same thing. But somewhere along the way, we've learned to support our opinion. So when I go into the Word, do I go to try to justify what I think or do I take time to find out what God thinks? Wisdom for the hour. Wisdom, there are many wise things that men can do, but pray is the best. Pray is not just what I do when somebody's sick. Pray is not just what I do when I need to know some basic information. Prayer is my constant communication with the Lord. Pray is my constant being engaged with him. Pray is when I am at work, but I've left the communication gap open in case he wants to drop something on me in the middle of nowhere, right? Pray is when I just keep the, keep the lines open and say, you know what? I can't let you on this channel. If you ever worked at a shipyard or a refinery, everybody's got a different channel they communicate on. And you know what? You got to make sure you keep that line open because that communication may have to come through in a moment you need to hear it. Well, that's the way the channel with God is. We got to make sure that the channel of communication with God stays open. And I can't let anything get on that channel and talk. I can't let anything get on that channel. Let me tell you what that channel looks like. It is the channel that gives the greatest access to my opinion. That's the channel that only belongs to God. Information that affects you the most should only come from the Lord. But what the enemy does, he tries to tap into that signal. And he tries to send some false signals our way. And he tries to get to us through our gates and through our eyes and through our ears and tries to make us observe things a little differently. He tries to affect our opinion a little differently. But I have to go back and judge the wisdom that I'm hearing. Is this thing, is it pure? Is it peaceable? Is it gentle? Because I've realized that there's been some reaction that I've had as, no, as none of those. I realize there's been some revealing in my heart with some things that I didn't even think I dealt with. But let me tell you something, under the press, everything gets pushed out, right? 
I'm not going to use getting ready for a colonoscopy as an example. <laughs> hey, anybody ever had a colonoscopy? I have. I'm not going to say nothing else. You get it. You get clean. You get clean. Let's go to the book of Exodus in chapter 2. We're going to leave there and go to Acts chapter 7. Now, we're going to Exodus chapter 2. Now, mind you, you're going to go to, if you was to go to Numbers in chapter 12, I believe it is, you would see written of Moses, he was the meekest man in all the earth. I've called Noah that before, but I was wrong. You, got to, you preach enough, you'll say something wrong and go with it. And you're like, God, why didn't you stop me? He's like, ah, just having a good time watching you. I'm just kidding. In the book of Exodus chapter 2, this is Moses, right? This is Moses, the meekest man in all the earth, right? And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens and he spied an Egyptian, smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now listen to this. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. You know, anytime you got to look this way and look that way, whatever you're fixing to do, don't do it. Whatever you're fixing to say, don't say it. Right? Taylor was here with little Isaac a while ago. He's running. He's walking now. They know what no means very quickly because when they go to do it, they will look at you first. Right? If they know they got to look at you to make sure you ain't looking, they know what they're doing is wrong. Tear them up. I'm just kidding. That's just what I did. Y'all do what you want to do. But uh, when Moses took this time to look this way and to look that way, I mean, something should have registered. When I read it, I thought, come on now, Moses. You know, you know what you was finna do is wrong. If you got to make sure ain't nobody looking, right? So he went out the second day and behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together and he said to him that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow, good King James verses. And he said, who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. Now jump to Acts in chapter seven. Now, how many of us know that Moses was called to lead the children of Israel out? I mean, that's what his, that's what his purpose was. And so we go to Acts in chapter 7. And we're going to go to verse 23. And this is the story. This is Stephen repeating this story, giving us just a hair more insight here. It says, and when he was a full 40 years old, I am 40 years old right now, it came to pass in his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So God put it in his heart. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For see, he supposed his brethren would have understood. They would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. They understood not. Who made thee a prince over us? Well, God made him a prince. But because Moses had an impression, an inclination, a word from God that you're going to deliver my people, and it's not recorded, that interaction. We don't hear that initial interaction with God. As a matter of fact, it don't even tell us in Exodus. It tells us here in Acts. It tells us right here, he said that, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. So somewhere God spoke to Moses and said, you're going to deliver my people. You're going to deliver my people. And he went out with that knowledge. But the worst thing we can ever do is get direction from God and disconnect from God to go bring his direction to pass. We get a word from God and we disconnect from God and bring his will to pass our own way. For he supposed his brethren, they would have understood. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? 
But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou did the Egyptian yesterday? The meekest man in all the earth. The meekest man in all the earth made a mistake like that. Man, what are we, what are we capable of? What are we capable of? And then the Lord dropped this in my spirit. I think I may have wrote it down. Moses had a destiny to deliver his brethren. Murder at his hand was not the way. What if the 40 years wasn't the preparing of Moses only, but also the preparing of the others to receive him as their prince? We've always looked at that as God had to prepare Moses. What if God had to prepare them to accept him as their deliverer? Because in a moment he acted out in his own wisdom. He didn't judge his actions against the wisdom of God. What if God has put something in your heart? The enemy is trying to get us to act out in our flesh to discredit us by what God has called us to do. If you call yourself a Christian, the enemy is always trying to discredit you. Oh, I thought you were saved. You ever heard that? Oh, I thought you was a Christian. Everybody knows how a Christian is supposed to live when it comes to how you're supposed to treat them whether they saved or not. I have had more heathen people or non-believers tell me how I'm supposed to act when they themselves are not even trying to live right. Oh, yeah, but I ain't a Christian. Well, then how do you know how I'm supposed to act? Right? Even Christians, we do this to each other. Right? I will take advantage of your Christianity. And I will expect you to be a Christian even when I'm not acting like one. Right? All right, that's too much. One thing Moses didn't understand, God didn't want him to deliver one. He didn't want him to deliver one Hebrew in a moment. He wanted him to deliver them all. He wanted him to deliver them all. Maybe it was hard for Moses to understand that. Maybe God told Moses, you're going to deliver them at your hand. You're going to deliver them. And he says, God, I can't deliver all of them but I can deliver this one. And he missed the big picture because of an inadequate opinion of himself. He missed what God was saying because it was so big. Man, has God ever told you something so great it kind of freaked you out? You thought, God, I can never do that? He will talk to him. He will tell you something. You're thinking, God, there is no way I can do that. God, I don't have enough time I don't have enough money. I don't have enough anything. God, I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough self-control, right? I don't have enough anything, right? And if I'm not careful, I will settle into my natural wisdom and I will tell God something like this. Now, God, I may not can do that, but I'll do this. And I will be justified in what I'm trying because it's hard to believe God when he really talks to us. I mean, it is, if we're honest. I mean, God says some crazy things to people. I mean, we tell the story of Gideon understanding that, you know, he brought this great victory. I mean, but Gideon is just trying to live. Like, he's just stretching a little wheat trying to feed his family, right? He's, it ain't, it, he's just trying to make it day to day. And then God's saying, hey, you're going you're gonna to be the one. You're going to be the one to deliver this whole people. What if he went and killed one Midian and said, well, I didn't deliver us all, but I got one of them. There would have still been a Midian, uh, there would still been an oppression of the Midianites. So we have to make sure that our actions are lined up with the white, with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. So what do I do? We always hear pray. Let me tell you something. We are called to action. Faith without works is dead. But my works have to be born out of my faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if I don't have a word from God, then I have nothing for my faith to attach to. And if I have nothing for my faith to attach to, then my works can't justify anything. So there is a time for action, right? And we can't sit on our hands, but we have to make sure that our action is born out of our faith. Now, how do we get a word for our faith to attach to? We pray. There it is again. We pray. 
I mean, when pastor said we can stop everything, but we can't stop prayer, that is a reality. We have got to pray. And it goes back to the disciples. They didn't ask Jesus how to be an apostle. They didn't ask him how to prophesy. They didn't ask him how to cast out a devil. They didn't ask him how to do, they didn't ask him how to walk on water. They didn't ask him how to quiet a storm. They didn't ask him how to multiply the food. They didn't ask him anything but one thing. Teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. They understood that that was the key to his success. They understood how could he have a Garden of Gethsemane experience because that wasn't the first time his will had to be broken. Do you think that was the first time that that was contradictory to what he wanted to do? Absolutely not, right? You don't learn calculus before you learn how to add. There has to be a progression. There has to be a building. The thing we forget sometimes is Jesus was really a man on the earth. It's hard to understand how he could be so perfect, right? Because we're so imperfect. So Jesus had learned through his life to crucify his will. He had already learned how to take his cross up daily. And he would tell people, if you want to follow me, take your cross up daily. Because you have a lot of opinions and you have a lot of thoughts that are just got to die. You got a lot of ways of looking at things that's not right. I was born in sin. I was shaping in iniquity. Right? So a lot of things about how I view the world has not been sanctified yet. Can y'all agree with that? And I have to spend time with God to understand that. Let's go to the book of Habakkuk. So we're going to look at how this, how that, what does this look like? How do we, how do we go to God and how do we get wisdom for this hour? How do we make sure that what we're doing and even our opinion is based on the will of God and the heart of God. How do we understand that I can have a brother with a different opinion than me and he can still belong to God? Anybody got brothers and sisters in the natural? Are y'all alike? No. Do you ever shake your head looking at them? Absolutely. My brothers probably shook their head looking at me, my sister. You're thinking, man, but you know what? You still got the same mom and daddy. And you wonder how sometimes, right? How we got the same mom and daddy. You know what? It's no different in the Lord. I know it's, it, we, don't, we don't understand that. But you know what? There's people, you know what? If you're a white conservative Republican, hey, this is hard for some people to understand live stream. You might have a black Democrat brother. Like we don't understand that in some instances and vice versa. Because how could you, how could we have the same Heavenly Father in our opinion be so different? Because we're all getting our opinion sanctified. We're all getting our opinion sanctified. We're all getting our, our lens clean. We're all getting our perspective straightened. But I'm going to tell you, this is how you can know. This is how you can know. You spend time with God. You spend time with God. And so you go to the book of Habakkuk. Let's go there. This is going to be my landing spot. I'm already at the landing spot, but it's a very long runway. Uh, we'll see how it goes from here. It is only 1120. I'm feeling good. I feel like we're going to be okay. We're in the book of Habakkuk. If I ask anybody that is familiar with the book, they will probably read the verse, write the vision down, make it plain, right? The historical context of the book of Habakkuk is follows the book of Nahum. The book of Nahum is like uh, the book of Jonah, except they didn't repent, right? Jonah went to Nineveh. He didn't want to preach because he knew that God was good. I mean, that's, that's probably faith. If you knew your message was going to be so good, everybody repent. Jonah knew that. Jonah knew that he was going to, be, he was going to deliver the word of the Lord so good that the whole town was going to repent. And he knew God was so good that God would forgive him and he didn't want God to forgive him. Ain't that crazy? He didn't want God to forgive him. He said, look, God, these people have afflicted us long enough and I really don't appreciate you giving them mercy. You know what? That's going on right now, right here in America. I'm telling you. We look in one side to the other. God, I really don't appreciate you talking to them when well, you know they're wrong. 
And, they're, and the other side is saying about this side. His ways are past finding out. Right? We think we know some stuff. We don't know anything. Knowledge puffeth up. Right? When we know something, we get arrogant about it. We finally figure something out and it puffeth us, it puffeth us up. Don't that make any sense? I can't even say it, right? That's about how it goes. We finally figure something out and we ruin it with pride. I feel like Moses. I'm a little tongue-tied. We're going to get through it. Because there's a wisdom from God that we've got to have. We've got to have a wisdom because you know what? God may be calling us to do something greater. In a Bible in the beginning, we may discount the voice. Right? God may be calling us to be a voice that can bring the opinion in the, of heaven. What if we could bring the opinion of heaven to a place? What if we could see past our differences in our political position and get the opinion of heaven? Right? What if that was possible? I mean, what if that was a real possibility? But you know what? The enemy says if I can get them in the flesh for just a moment, and I can get them to act in their own strength for just a moment. If I can get them just to do something that they can do, then they'll never do what I can do through them. Go ahead and let it out, brother. <laughs> hey. We're in the book of Habakkuk. So here Habakkuk is. He's right here, and he is hearing from God. We don't know anything about him. You don't know if he's a Levite, if he's from the tribe of Simeon. You know, I've done a lot of research trying to figure out who this guy is. They believe he was around long enough. He's around 610 B.C. Uh, the Babylonian captivity came in in 588 B.C. That was in Daniel's day. It is even believed that Habakkuk may have fed Daniel in the lion's den, right? So this is kind of where we're at in history. And so he's getting the word from God that the Babylonians are going to take them into captivity. That is not what you want to hear when you pray to God. You don't want to hear that things are going to get worse and not better. If I go to God about the state of America, I want to hear God say, great things are coming. Restoration is coming. What if that's not what he says? What if he says things are going to get worse before they get better? I am weary of good time prophets. Things aren't always good in the natural. Things aren't always going to turn out like you think. Where we're at right now may not end up like we think it'll end up. But everything God said at this point still stands. And so Habakkuk is having a, a real conversation with God. And I know he's a praying man because you don't have these kind of conversations with God unless you talk to him before. And so he's, and I, I, may read, I may read the whole first two chapters. We'll see how it goes. Because I want us to understand the tone that he's talking in. The burden with Habakkuk the prophet did see, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry and wilt thou not hear? Even cried unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why do you show me iniquity? Why do you call me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me and there are, and there are that raise up strife and contention? Therefore the law is slacked and judgment does never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. I don't know if you know what he's saying, but he's saying, God, you're wrong. What's happening? <laughs> that even makes me nervous saying that. But we say the same thing in our hearts too. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. You may not speak it, but God knows what you're thinking. But he's, okay. he, he's having this conversation with God because he's talked to him before. And he's really working through what he don't understand. And God understands that and God responds to him. And what's going on now is the Babylonians have already taken Nineveh, right? The judgment against the Assyrians have already taken place. Babylonians have already taken the Nineveh. They've already taken Egypt, and they're coming for Judah. That's what's next. And so God says, look, I raised them up. I raised up the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible, and they are dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed out of themselves. Their horses, man, they're swifter than leopards. And they're more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from far and they shall fly as the eagle that hastes to eat. 
and they shall come all for violence. And their face shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity at the sand. I'd have said, hold up, Lord. It's a little much. I mean, this ain't really with the conversation I was wanting to have. He said, and they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall ride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this power, his power unto his God. He said, he's going to do all this, and he's going to think it's his God that's let him do it. Art thou from everlasting, O Lord? This is Habakkuk saying, look, God, ain't you from everlasting? Mine holy one, we shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. He's starting to understand a little bit now. You've ordained these people to judge us because we have sinned. The one act we see of Jesus was judgment must begin at the house of God, and that's the one place we saw him act in anger was in the house of God. I say that the, the issues we have in America is the issues we've not dealt with in the church. If the church would deal with issues, America would reap the benefit of it. We're the ones called to lead our nation. We're still looking at presidents. We still look at elections. We still look at the natural atmosphere. But we don't realize we hold the spiritual tone of our nation in our hands. It is our relationship with God that causes us to prosper and it's our relationship with God that causes us to fail. This is not an indictment against a political party. This is not an indictment against a race. It is an indictment against the church. God has put the spiritual state of the country in the church's hands. Anybody agree with that? that that's where we're at. We have that much power, but we don't want to know that because that requires something of us. That requires me living past my opinion. That requires me living past my thoughts on an issue. Right? He says, you are pure eyes than to behold evil. This is verse 13. You can't look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he. He's saying, God, we've been bad, but they've been way worse. How are you letting this happen to us by their hand? This is what he's saying. He said, and you make men as the fish of the sea. They, they make men the fish of the sea, creeping things that have no rule over them. They do all these things. Verse 17, shall they empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? God, they're going to kill us and everybody else too. But chapter 2, verse 1, this is, this, is a, this is where we have got to get to. This is where we have to get, and this is where we have to set our feet. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. He said, but you know what? I know all these things are coming to pass. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be. What comes or what goes, I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be. If you agree, if my friends disagree, it doesn't matter. I'm going to stand where I'm supposed to stand and I'm going to wait and see what is God going to do. Everybody wants us to rush to a side and rush to an opinion, but I've got to know what thus saith the Lord is. I cannot afford to operate out of my own understanding and wisdom. Let me tell you the most important heritage I carry is the one my daddy passed down to me. It is the one that caused me to be in this place right here. It's the one that says, you know what? My greatest identity is man of God. It is bigger than dad. It is bigger than husband. It is man and child of God. And my actions have to reflect that. But my actions can't reflect that until my opinion does. Because my wisdom is born out of my opinion. And if my opinion don't change, that's something that you don't see because you don't really know how I feel about some things. But God does. You don't really know where I side with a few issues, but God does. And, and I, can't, I can't let those things leak. I can't let my opinion leak because my opinion ain't sanctified all the way yet. 
I, I, can't, I can't have these conversations around the water cooler because I don't have a sanctified opinion yet. And you may be a Christian and you may not even care what your opinion is sanctified or not. That doesn't give me liberty to let mine leak out. Does that make sense? So what did Habakkuk say? I'm going to stand upon my watch. So you go to Ezekiel. I'll just read it. Everybody, This is a verse that's been highly quoted. Where is it at, brother? You got Ezekiel? And I saw for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. You know, Habakkuk realized his opinion was different than God's opinion. But he also realized that God's opinion was way more important. He says, you know what, God? I don't really even agree with what's going on. I don't like how you're doing things, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go stand in my place. I'm going to go stand upon my watch. I'm going to be in the gap. I'm going to be in the gap. He was interceding for the country. He was interceding for the nation. You know what? And God told him, we'll get there in just a second. All right. In the gap that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I cannot stand in the gap when my opinion is the prevailing rule in my life. If Jesus isn't king of my thoughts, I cannot stand in the gap because I judge everything wrong. I judge everything wrong. I will judge a man by his actions and expect him to judge me by my motives. That's what Moses did. Oh, my motives were pure. No, no, I, I, and I'm not going to kill you. When I killed the Egyptian, I had a good heart. I don't care if you have a good heart if you're doing bad, right? Even a child is known by doing, but I love Jesus. Yeah, but you just blacked my eye, right? Come go to church with me, right? Even though you just cussed me out, right? I'm not going to church with you. Therefore have I poured out my indignation. This is, the, this is the end result. This is where our opinion gets us. And you know what? Habakkuk had to suffer too. He had to suffer too. Right? If I let my opinion be the prevailing power of my life and I let my thought process and my understanding be what rules me, then I will suffer the indignation of God like the rest of America. That sounds kind of hard, don't it? Man, we don't have a great, we don't just have this great weighty responsibility. We have this great opportunity. We have a great opportunity to be, to be that man that stands in the gap because he didn't want to do it. Do you know that God did not want to do it? He, would have, he said, look, I saw for a man, I looked for somebody. I looked for anybody that would look past their opinion and actually seek me over the situation and actually get a word from me on it that I could turn my indignation. But he said, I didn't find any. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, said the Lord of God. Said the Lord God. Man, we have an opportunity in history right now. We got an opportunity to spend time with God and get a dust set to the Lord. And when I get a dust set to the Lord, my faith has something to attach to. And when my faith has something to attach to, I know what to do. I know what to do. I've got directions now. I know how to handle this. Because let me tell you something, find somebody that agrees with me and complaining about it does nothing. You can find somebody to agree with you. There's somebody that's just as bitter as you are. There's somebody just as angry as we are. There's somebody just as upset as we are. And we love to fuss and complain just as much. But I don't have that privilege. I don't have that right. And you know what? You don't either. You don't either. You know what? Before I'm white, I'm a Christian. Before I'm black, I am a Christian. Before I'm a conservative, I am a Christian. Before I'm a liberal, I'm a Christian. Before I'm anything, that is my greatest identity. Is Christian, son of God. Pam talked Friday night just for a moment mentioning the transition to a kingdom. We have to get kingdom understanding. Kingdom understanding that we are part of a kingdom. A kingdom has its own governing body. We trusted in natural things even as a church. We prayed that if the right man would get in office, everything would be okay. If the right things naturally would take place, everything would be okay. 
And pastor even said it uh, recently. We, we, the finances got good, so we got comfortable. Money got right, so everything's all right. Money was good, everything else is kind of, if as long as money's right, everything else will be okay. And we kind of fell into that mammon. You can't serve two masters. And it's interesting that when this is being spoken of, he didn't say you, couldn't, you can't serve God and Dagon. He didn't say you couldn't serve God and Zeus or you can't serve God and some other God. He said you can't serve God and you can't serve money. That is the other option. He didn't even say you can't serve God and serve Satan. He said you can't serve God and money because that's where we put our trust sometimes as Christians. That's the conflict of a Christian. If everything is okay in the natural, even this Bible says money answers is to answer to all things from a natural perspective. But we have to look past that and say, okay, God, what are you saying in this hour? God, I see things going on. Let me tell you something. The enemy has taken a real problem with a, and brought a bad solution. How's the church going to respond? There's real issues the enemy has took the lead on. It says, you know what? I will destroy the nation with this issue. And the only opposing force he has is the church. Can I look past what somebody is doing naturally to see what the enemy is doing spiritually? But I've got to get past my thoughts on things. And I've got to get past what I'm seeing and how that makes me feel. And I've got to dig in and say, okay, God, if you've got to cut the news off for a week, I, I'm going to tell you one thing that would happen. Anxiety would leave. If you cut the news off for a week, anxiety would be gone, right? You wouldn't have a bit of angst, angst in you. All you would know is what God was saying. What if you spent a week only hearing from the Lord? Yeah. Well, you got to stay informed, brother. Well, God can't tell me something sometime. <laughs> the problem is we're too informed. We're too informed. The information age has got us too informed. We're so informed on the natural things that we don't know what's going on spiritually. We're dealing with first heaven problems that's a product of second heaven situations, but we got to get to the third heaven to get answers. He calls us always to triumph in Christ. Where's Christ? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's still there. I've got to get to where he's at. I've got to get his perspective. I've got to leave this realm, and I've got to get up to where he's at. I can only do that in prayer. I can only do that in time spent with him. I can only get to the position where right perspective is because if I stay right here, I judge from right here. I judge everything laterally. I judge everything laterally, and I, can, I, I can't do that. I would want to kick something over, right? That's my natural response, so I can't respond naturally. I can't even get to the second and see what's the spirit realm doing. Now I got to see what is God doing? What is God? He's above all principalities and power. He's above them all. And I got to say, okay, God, you're above them all. Let me see what you see. Let me see what you see. Let me see what you see. Brother Gary, you can come on up. Let me see what you see, Lord. What's your perspective on this thing? God, I'm trying to save this and I'm trying to save that. God, what are you, what, what can I do that's going to reap kingdom benefit the greatest? Right? What's going to reap the greatest kingdom benefit in this hour? What's going to bring the greatest change? What's going to bring the greatest impact from a spiritual perspective? Because there's been many worse and there's going to be a harvest of souls. There's going to be a harvest of souls. There still is. Like this hasn't stopped salvation from taking place. Matter of fact, hard times run people to the Lord, right? We think people running from God. No, there's people running to God. There's people running to God by the thousands saying, God, this unrest and this unsettling has got me. I can't deal with the anxiety. I've got to be connected to something greater than I am. We are the church. We are what they're looking for. We have the answers. We're scared to say it because we think we don't have the answers. They may not agree with me. In the end, we win. I've, we've got to understand the power that we carry. Christ in us, the hope of glory. If you go on down in, in Habakkuk, I'll read this as Brother Gary starts to play. He's going through all this and he's telling what's fixing to happen. And he tells them, I'm going to try to find it, I'll just quote it. 
Verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That verse is quoted under the context of impending doom. He's saying, Habakkuk, you got to see past what's going on right now. You got to see past these Babylonians coming in to, because you know what? I've ordained them because I'm trying to work some things out in you. I'm not trying to work it out in them. Their judgment's coming. But judgment must first begin at the house of God. I'm trying to work some things out in you. And you know what? I, and if you go on down, he tells them, I'm going to take care of them. Their day's coming, but it's your day right now. And let me tell you something. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. The glory's already here. We just don't know it yet. There's not going to be an increase in glory. There's going to be an increase in awareness. There can't be an increase of presence. There's an increase of awareness. God can't increase and decrease. We can only increase awareness. God can't come in the room any more than he already is. He just increases our awareness. Right? And so what he's saying in the midst of this hard times, guess what? I know you're discouraged. I know it looks hard. But rest assured, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. Everybody stand to your feet this morning. This morning, Lord, we just come to you, Lord. God, I pray that our hearts would be settled, God. Lord, we judge by so much how we're affected naturally, Lord. God, we judge things so much by how we're affected in the natural, God. God, give us spiritual eyes and spiritual perspective. Give us spiritual perspective, Lord. God, let us glimpse into the realm of the unseen, God, knowing that the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God, I pray, God, that our opinion will be aligned with your opinion. God, I pray that our thoughts, God, they're not your thoughts, but I pray they will be. God, our ways are not your ways, but I pray they will be. God, I pray we would have such a revelation of who you are, God, and, who, and what your plan for this hour is, Lord. God, we're seeking racial reconciliation, God. Lord, let us address the enemy behind it. God, let us not go through an outward motion, just walking through the motions of things, God. Let us address the enemy that trains, tries to bring division. God, we're not trying to expose something that's not real, God. We want to see the fruit and the heart of the matter, God. But I pray, God, this morning, God, that we would take time to focus in on you, God, that we would take our place in the gap, Lord. God, that you're a big God. You can handle our thoughts. You can handle our opinions, God. You can handle us being real with you, God. God, but I pray that when we've been real, that we get in our position. God, I pray that when we've been honest with you, God, and we will expose our hearts to you. I pray, God, that we could find our place on the wall. I pray we could find our place in the gap. I pray that we could have the words of Jesus that says, not my will, but thy will be done. God, we need wisdom right now, Lord. We need wisdom as individuals on our jobs. We need wisdom in the marketplace. God, we need wisdom in our goings and comings, Lord. We need wisdom of heaven, Lord, to lead us, God, and to guide us, God. God, we know that wisdom is crying out, Lord. It's not hard to find. It is searching for us. And if we'll seek wisdom early, we'll find it. And God, I pray in this hour, Lord, God, we'll be a beacon of hope and a beacon of light. We'll be a beacon of truth, a truth that destroys the yoke of the enemy, Lord. God, I pray we'll not get sidetracked in any battle of the natural God. God, we'll wage war in the spirit, Lord. That we'll walk those ordered footsteps, God, that you've given us. Lord, we're trusting you with our lives. We're trusting you with our nation as you've entrusted the nation unto us. Lord, we take our position on the wall, God, of America. And God, I pray, God, what the enemy meant to destroy us, what he meant for evil, God, your turn for good. I pray, God, out of the ashes of the problems and the situations we're in, God, there'll be an even greater, Lord. I pray a greater measure of the awareness of the anointing that's been poured out, God. I pray, Lord God, even as you birth what we understand as modern Pentecost, 
right here on this very soil, God. God, I pray, God, that our hearts will stay in tune and inclined to your will, God. We would understand, God, the enemy's desire to take this land. And God, we would take our claim on the wall to say, not on our watch. God, I pray, God, that we would be a men and women that voice your opinion above our own. God, I know there's no answer that makes everybody happy, Lord. God, we want to make you happy. God, I know there is no answer that everybody's good with, God, but we want you to be good with what we do. And God, I pray this morning, God, that you give us boldness to walk in what's right. And you give us courage to slay the giant of a pain in our own life. And God, we just give you the praise for all you're doing in our hearts and in our body and in our area. Church, just open the altars this morning. You know, we, we're, we look back in our lives and we look back at times where, you know, and I bring this way back down to just an everyday life kind of situation and I, you know, maybe there was a situation that you handled that you heard from God on it, but maybe we acted out a little bit early in our own strength. And maybe you're in the place that Moses was in when he was off in that wilderness and he was having to walk out the fruit of a premature action Man, we have fractured so many things with our flesh. My Lord, I wish I could go back and reel in a million words in my life. I wish I could change a few decisions in my life. And I'm going to tell you, I have walked in some wildernesses because I have done things out of zeal with a partial revelation. Man, I have done things in zeal, wanting to serve and please God, I heard God say at the beginning and I took off. You know what? It has cost and I have paid some prices and still am paying a few of them. You know, maybe that's where you're at this morning. So we all open our altars up this morning. Just a time to pray and say, God, Lord, I've done been down this road. Lord, I've jumped out ahead of you. I've gotten bitter and I prayed and I didn't like what you said. You know, Habakkuk could have got mad about what God said. Habakkuk could have said, God, I don't like what you're doing and I'm not, gonna, I'm not in agreement with what you're saying. And he'd have never heard. Guess what, son? The earth's going to be filled with the knowledge of my glory. He'd have never heard that verse. We'd have never read it. But because he chose to align himself with God, because he chose to align, even when he heard something he didn't want to hear, you know what? God may tell us some things we don't want to hear. He is. He's going to tell us some things we don't want to hear. But we just got to want to hear Him. So this morning, Lord, I know, God, that there's so much weightiness in the house, Lord. I know, God, what you've called us to, Lord. It's hard, God, to abandon our natural identity to be solely identified by you, Lord. Lord, it's difficult, God. And I know you know this. God, even in our past, Lord, even in our everyday lives, Lord, we have got ahead of you in ways, God. And God, there's a, there's some, there's some breaks and there's some chasms in our lives, Lord. There's some relationships that are broken because we acted prematurely, God. Lord, there's some people that we prayed for, Lord, that we, we jumped a little ahead of you on, God, and they're away from you, Lord. There's some offenses that we've caused, God. Lord, that the children of Israel suffered 40 years of bondage. They may not have to have suffered. God, I pray, Lord, that you would give us opportunity, Lord. God, to bridge some gaps that we've caused in our lives, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that sons and daughters, Lord, would come home. God, I pray for sons and daughters to come home, Lord, this morning. God, I pray that in our zeal to love our families, Lord, in our desire to see our loved ones come to know you, Lord, if there be any gap in that relationship, God, that was born even out of our own zeal, 
God, you'd bridge that gap. Church, I really feel that in my spirit this morning. Many times because we know our heart and we act out of our zeal and our passion, many times if we're not careful, we'll do a driving away more than a coming in, a calling in. I really feel the Lord is wanting to restore some relationships that were broken out of a good heart. Some relationships that's been broken out of our good heart to reach out and love on our loved ones and love on our family. I really feel a breaking family tie right here. So Lord, this morning, God, we just ask, Lord, through your spirit, God, bring healing to the situation. God, let us operate in humility, Lord. God, let us be wrong even if we're not wrong. God, let us take the low place, Lord. And humble our hearts, Lord, to bring restoration in areas, Lord. God, I pray for restoration in families this morning, Lord. God, I pray for restoration in America this morning, God. God, I pray the church would rise up in humility and boldness, God. How can we be humble and bold at the same time? You were, Jesus. You were. Let us walk with your demeanor, Lord. Let us walk with absolute faith in who we are and absolute submission to your plan and your will, Father. Lord, this morning we just pray, God, oh, teach us to be more like you, Lord. Your word tells us, Lord, when we get saved, Lord, we enter into a destiny to be conformed into your image, the image of the only begotten Son of God. Lord, we have a destiny to be like you, Jesus. Lord, help us to reach that destiny. Your will this morning, God, your will. Lord, we don't pray our own agenda. We don't pray our own thoughts. God, we pray that you would show us your agenda and your thoughts. And we would pray accordingly.